Tonight on Why New. Malacanang assures that President Rodrigo Duterte will inform the public about the result of his medical consultation after feeling unbearable pain in his spinal column. President Duterte appoints Associate Justice Peralta as the new Chief Justice. A lawmaker challenges three contenders for the position of the next PNP chief to undergo lifestyle checks. The Kaliwa Dam project earns environmental clearance despite alleged violations. And the flying taxi goes on a test spin in Singapore. Good evening. Malacanang assures the public yet again there's nothing to worry about President Rodrigo Duterte's health. Senator Christopher Bongo, the president's former top aide, even said the chief executive seems to have no plans to stop riding motorcycles even after a recent fall. Rosalie Cos details why. President Rodrigo Duterte was scheduled to consult with his neurologist today. He cut his Japan trip short after feeling unbearable pain in the spinal column. According to the palace, President Duterte will inform the public about the result of his medical consultation. He must consult with a doctor to determine if his previous spinal injury from a recent fall due to a motorcycle accident was aggravated. Presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo once again assures the public not to be apprehensive about the president's health. Last night, while going to the airport in Japan, his former top aide and now Senator Bongo went live on Facebook. The president mentioned the pain he has been enduring. However, the chief executive seems to have no plans to stop riding his motorcycle. Sa mga kapatid nating Pilipino, huwag kayong mag-alala. Nasa mabuting kalagayan po ang ating mahal na Pangulo. Nandito pa, nagbabasa ng kanyang mga paboritong litrato ng motor. At hindi hindi pa rin daw siya titigil magmotor dahil hindi daw siya mabubuhay kung hindi daw siya magmumotor. Ayun no. Motor pa rin ang tinitingnan. Uh, kahit masakit na yung likod niya, ay motor pa rin ang nasa isipan niya. The president was represented by his daughter Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte Carpio at the Emperor's and Prime Minister's Banquet in Tokyo, Japan yesterday. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. Meanwhile, former presidential top aide and now, for, and now Senator Christopher Bongo reveals President Rodrigo Duterte has undergone magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. He reveals a doctor has advised the president to take a few days rest. According to Senator Go, the president is just experiencing muscle spasms. The doctor only prescribed him pain reliever. The senator also assures there is nothing to worry about his condition and the president's schedule will push through, including welcoming the visiting Chinese vice premier tomorrow at the palace, as well as his participation in the ASEAN summit in November. <music> president Rodrigo Duterte appoints Associate Justice Diosdado Peralta as the new PNP as the new Chief Justice, according to Malacanang. Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea confirms. The chief executive signed Peralta's appointment papers today. Peralta is a former presiding justice of the Sandigan Bayan anti graft Court and the most senior among the three justices endorsed by the Judicial and Bar Council. He is set to retire in March 2022. He is the successor of former court chief justice Lucas Bersamin, who retired five days ago, October 18. A congressman challenges three contenders for the PNP chief position to undergo lifestyle checks. Find out what their answers are as Leia Ilagan reports. Two of the three contenders for the Philippine National Police Chief Post have accepted the challenge of anti-crime and terrorism community involvement and support or act CIS party list representative Eric Yap for them to undergo lifestyle check. Deputy Chief for Operations, Police Lieutenant General Camilo Cascolan said, Go! 
in a short text message to UNTV News, meaning he is in favor of a lifestyle check. Chief Directorial Staff, Police Major General Guillermo Eliazar also texted UNTV News and said there is no problem if they underwent a lifestyle check. While PNP OIC, Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa did not directly answer the questions if he is willing to accept the challenge. Instead, he implores to respect the decision of the President. I'll say this for once, no? Lifestyle check, open mo ba yung salin mo, etc. Now, remember, there's a vetting process of which is being undertaken by the office of the president. So whatever the suggestions of the public on how the president should choose the next GPNP, I suggest we respect the president. Gamboa added he wants to separate his being the PNP OIC from being a contender for the PNP chief post. I suggest and I fully recommend that we leave it up to the office of the president who is actually mandated by law to choose the next chief PNP. Gamboa, Cascolan, and Eliazar are the three recommendations of Interior Secretary and National Police Commission Chairman Eduardo Año to President Rodrigo Duterte to be the country's next top cop. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, Cam Crame. The PNP spokesperson believes a case filed by the Criminal Investigation and Detection Group or CIDG against former PNP chief Oscar Albayalde is strong and will stand in court. Lea Ilagan will tell us why. The Philippine National Police believe that the case filed by the Criminal Investigation and Detection Group or CIDG against resigned PNP chief Police General Oscar Albayalde is strong. Hindi naman uh, CIDG natin ay hindi naman gagawa o magsasampa ng uh, kaso na ang hindi uh, handa. Kaya ang mga ebidensya na hawak nila ay uh, base sa mga dokumento at mga testimonya at ito ay uh, inaniniwala natin na tatayo sa korte. The PNP spokesperson's reaction comes after Baguio City Mayor Benjamin Magalong stated that the case was filed without enough preparations and could be dismissed soon. The CIDG Director, Police Major General Amador Corpus, is a mista or classmate of General Albayalde. But the PNP spokesperson said, Ito lang naging kinalaman ito sa anong mga uh, ugnayan o magiging pagkaklase. Uh, ito ay base talaga sa mga panibagong mga testimonya at ebidensya na nakalap ng CIDG. Corpus, who was the Director of Police Regional Office 3 before, decided to impose a one-rank team motion instead of dismissal on the 13 ninja cops involved in the anomalous drug operations in Mexico, Pampanga in 2013. On Friday, October 17, the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee headed by Senator Richard Gordon recommended to file a case against former PNP Chief Police General Oscar Albayalde for his possible involvement in the operations. On Monday, the CIDG filed a case with the Department of Justice against General Albayalde and the 13 Ninja Cops. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krami. The MWSS has secured a permit for the Kaliwa Dam project that will cover over 9,000 hectares of land, but a group opposes, saying the project violates environmental laws. Ray Pelayo explains why. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources has issued an Environmental Compliance Certificate or ECC to the Metropolitan Water and Sewer System for the Kaliwadam Project. Environment Undersecretary Benny Antiporda says the ways on how to mitigate the dam project's impact on the environment and residents in the area that will be affected are stipulated in the ECC. Antiporda stresses the MWSS must secure first the permission of the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, or NCIP, who represents indigenous groups in the country. Nakakahon yung ating pong uh, pagprotekta sa ating mamamayan. If in case, hindi nila sundin o tuktin yung kanilang ginawang yan, abay, wala kayong magagawa kundi recall yung ECC na yan. Kaliwa Dam will be erected in the areas that are part of the municipalities of General Nakar and Infanta Quezon Province. 
It has a height of 60 meters and can supply 600 million liters of water per day to around 3 million individuals. China will fund 85% of the 12.2 billion pesos cost of the project. It will have a 4 meter diameter tunnel with 200 meter under the ground and a 27.7 kilometer stretch. The outlet portal will be placed in Teresa Rizal. The watershed will cover 9,800 hectares of land. A group that opposes the project said around 5,000 individuals will be displaced if the project pushes through. One of the areas to be submerged is Barangay Daraitan, which is one of the popular tourist spots in Tanay Rizal. The group insists the public consultation did not follow the proper procedure. Ang isisi ng sakaliwadap is illegal. Uh, it contradicts uh, and violates the the law uh, on environmental impact assessment. The DNR assures to closely monitor the project. The MWSS targets to begin the project in the first quarter of next year to be operational in 2023. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The first sections of the Cavite Laguna Expressway or Calax will be open to the public by Wednesday, October 30. DPWA Secretary Mark Villar made the announcement yesterday after doing a final inspection of the sections which covered the Mamplasan Barrier to Laguna Techno Park Interchange, Laguna Boulevard Interchange, and all the way to Santa Rosa Tagaytay Interchange. In order to decongest Santa Rosa Tagaytay Road, Governor's Drive, Aguinaldo Highway, the DPWH chief said it is imperative to deliver the total 45 kilometer length of Calax by June 2022. The Calax project is designed to be a four lane tolled expressway that will connect Cavitex in Cawit to South Luzon Expressway or SLEX at the Mamplasan Interchange in Binyan, Laguna. German aviation firm Volcopter's electric air taxi took a test flight on Tuesday in Singapore's iconic Marina Bay. The flight itself, which was manned by a lone pilot, lasted for about two minutes despite concerns of cancellation due to sporadic rainstorms that morning. This is not the firm's first test flight in Singapore, but it is the first in the urban Marina Bay area. Singapore is one of the most advanced countries in the world in terms of its testing of autonomous vehicles and plans to deploy driverless buses in three districts of the island from 2022. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Baltazar, and here are the headlines. The LTFRB issues over 800 special bus permits in preparation for UNDAS. The Metropolitan Waterworks and Sewerage System, or MWSS, explains the looming rotational water service interruptions in Metro Manila. Magindanao Massacre Suspect Zaldi Ampatuan rushed to the hospital due to heart ailment. Senators pay tribute to late former Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. And the Global Health Fund reports that climate change hampers progress in fighting epidemics. Good evening. There will be less allocation for irrigation in the rice fields of Bulacan and Pampanga as the water level in Angat Dam drops or continues to drop. The MWSS also explains rotational water service interruptions in Metro Manila are necessary. Joe Anano tells us why. Due to the absence of rainfall at the Angat watershed in the previous weeks, the National Water Resources Board or NWRB will reduce the water allocation for irrigation of farms in the provinces of Bulacan and Pampanga by next month. From the current 30 cubic meters per second or CMS water allocation for irrigation, the NWRB will lower it to 17 CMS. Ito po ay kasama na rin sa pagmamanis natin ng supply, pero sa tingin po natin, by November ay hindi na rin po ganun kalaki ang pangailangan ng uh, tubig sa irrigation po. Doon na sila sa punto ng bago mag-ani, no? Despite the continuous drop of the water level in Angat Dam, the NWRB has yet to reduce the water allocation for Metro Manila. 
Meanwhile, Maynilad and Manila Water will begin another round of rotational water service interruptions beginning tomorrow. The Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System or MWSS explains it is necessary to manage the limited water supply these days to prevent the recurrence of water crisis last March. So, parang yung measure is uh, to lengthen the capacity of ANGAT to be able to supply us until summer ulit. And then hoping next year, wala nang yung linyo at magkaroon ka ng magandang tubig. Several customers are preparing for the scheduled water service interruption. Like my Mai, who owns an eatery in Quezon City. She says they've developed ways on how to conserve water for when there's water supply interruption. Uh, ang pagwala ng tubig, pag water interruption, ang ginagawa namin, yung plato po namin, nilalagyan na lang namin ng plastic. O tapos, tatanggalin na lang namin yun, hindi na kami naguhugas dahil wala nga pong tubig. Wala rin naman po kami stuck dito dahil maliit lang yung pwesto namin. The NWRB is still hopeful that rainfall will come in the remaining two months before the end of this year for Angat Dam to reach its 212 meters target level to satisfy the demand until the hot season next year. Joan Anu, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The lower house of Congress aims to pass the proposed bill on utilizing the rice subsidy fund worth 2.7 billion pesos by November. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. The House Committee on Agriculture and Food aims to pass the joint resolution that gives the government the right to utilize the fund allotted for rice subsidy. The fund will be used to purchase palay from Filipino farmers, which will be milled and then given to Pantawid Pamilyang Pilipino Program or Four Peace Beneficiaries. Under the joint resolution, Four Peace Beneficiaries will receive rice instead of cash as rice subsidy. According to Committee Chairman Congressman Wilfredo Mark Inverga, farmers from areas severely affected by the low buying price of palay will be the first to benefit from the measure. Nabanggit nila na meron silang sariling study rin uh, na mamap out dito kung alin yung mga, mga lalawigan na mas mababa pa yung presyo. So siguro dapat masama natin yung mga yon para makatulong tayo sa farmers. In Verga said there is around 2.7 billion pesos worth of rice subsidy fund for this year. We're hopeful na sana magkaroon ng certification from the President. So para pag-resume namin, within that day, eh, kaya na rin namin matapos at mapasa na ito. Uh, Makapag-bycam na kami ng Senate. Once the resolution gets certified as urgent by the President, Enverga believes they could pass it when session resumes on November 4. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. One week before Undas, some Filipinos have started to travel to their provinces. According to the management of the Araneta City bus station, they are expecting the influx of passengers starting Friday. Harleen Delgado explains why. Flor Abayo left today for her province, Masbate. She took a bus at the Araneta City bus station. She opted to travel a week before Undas, she said. Inaagaan na lang ang muna namin magsakay para ho, hindi mahirap pa. Salita Amante, on the other hand, bought a bus ticket early. Kung darating na yung undas, mahirap na ma'am sumakay. Kaya umuwi kagad kami ngayon pa lang. Nita Tagwa, who was headed to Aklan province, fell in line early to avoid the long queue of bus passengers. Hindi pa gaano maraming nagbayahe pag ganitong panahon. According to the Araneta City Bus Station Management, there are just a few passengers as of the moment. They are expecting the influx of passengers starting Friday. We double our money at nakikipagtulungan uh, din tayo o humihingi tayo ng assistance sa kapulisan. So nagde-deploy sila sa mga ganito okasyon ng karagdagan kapulisan dito sa terminal. Some passengers are also starting to flock to other bus stations in Cubao. Several bus trips going to Cagayan and Ilocos are already fully booked. Meanwhile, the Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board, or LTFRB, has granted 855 special permits to public utility buses, effective from October 30 to November 3, 2019. This is to ensure the sufficiency of trips in anticipation of the passenger influx for UNDAS. The LTFRB will also inspect bus terminals and garages starting Monday next week. 
The Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines, or CAOP, has also expressed readiness of its 42 commercial airports in the country. The Department of Transportation, meanwhile, will establish Malasakit help desks in public transport terminals across the country to assist passengers. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Kazan City. The Department of Labor and Employment reminds employers to release their workers' 13th month pay and bonuses on time. A labor group hopes the Congress will approve the 14th month pay bill before the year ends. Aiko Miguel explains why. There are 19 holidays in the Philippines this year. This is based on Proclamation No. 555 issued by President Rodrigo Duterte. Ten of these are regular holidays and nine are special non-working days. The Department of Labor and Employment or DOLA explains employees should know the difference between to know how much holiday pay they must receive. According to Director Teresita Cocueco of the DOLA Bureau of Working Conditions, double pay will be received when an employee works during a holiday. When it's your day off but you go to work, there is an additional 30% of your wage. But if you don't go to work, you will still receive your day's wage without deductions. When you go to work during special non-working days like November 1 and 2, you will receive additional 30% of your wage per day. But when it's your day off but you work on that day, half of your daily wage will be added to your basic wage. The no work, no pay rule will apply if a person doesn't go to work. During rare opportunities, when a date coincides with two holidays, an employee will receive triple pay when they go to work that day. It only comes during a very um, peculiar period, like if it's a double holiday. And this is really very specific. Lang. It's either on a, a, a month, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, at mumatak pa sa araw ng kagitingan. Pag nangyari yan, then that becomes uh, times 300% if they will work. And this time of year, employees await their 13th month pay equivalent to their monthly wage. According to Dole, it is stated in the labor law that a 13th month pay should be released to employees on or before December 24. We are asking the employers, it's in the law, the 13th month pay. This has already, it's supposed to really be part of the cost of the operations of any company and they should give it you know these are workers who have worked for the year and they deserve it other bonuses like a chairman's bonus is not mandatory this is voluntarily given to employees or an agreement between an employer and employees your employer is generous when you receive a bonus like a chairman's bonus a labor group hopes that the 14th month pay bill would be passed in congress before the year ends malaking bagay kapag yung ating kasalukuyang 13th month pay ay madadagdagan ng isa pang tinatawag na 14th month pay dahil malaking tulong ito para sa mga magagawa na nahihirapan na dahil sa mataas na presyo ng mga bilihin at halaga ng mga sirbisyo. Dole calls on employees to file a complaint against their employers who will release the late 13th month pay or will not give employees the due amount of their holiday pay. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Operators of shopping malls in Metro Manila have agreed to adjust their operating hours during the holiday season to help in the bid to ease the country's traffic woes. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, said mall operators agreed to open shop at 11 a.m. during weekdays starting November 11, 2019 until January 10, 2020. Mall sales will also be prohibited from Monday to Friday in the same period, the MMDA said. Deliveries of non-perishable goods will also be limited at nighttime from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Shopping mall operators also agreed on deploying additional security personnel to direct the flow of vehicles going inside mall parking areas which cause traffic gridlock. They also agreed to remove obstructions on loading and unloading bays in mall vicinities. The MMDA said the agreement was made during their meeting on Tuesday, which tackled traffic contingency measures to ease the anticipated traffic, particularly along EDSA during the holiday season. 
The Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board, or LTFRB, has opened the online application for Transport Network Vehicle Service, or TNVS. The online franchise appointment system is a response to the ease of doing business and efficient government service Delivery Act of 2018. In a statement, LTFRB Chairman Martin Delgra said they want the application process to be easier for drivers and TNVS operators. Hog racers and pork vendors in Cavite are worried of incurring losses after authorities confirmed that African swine fever caused the death of over 30 pigs in Dasmariña City. Nina Emilio reports why. Sales of pork in the Smarina City markets and in the entire Cavite province have gone lower. This after the Department of Agriculture confirmed that the African swine fever virus caused the deaths of 31 pigs in the city. Hog racers now fear of incurring losses, although their pigs are not yet affected by the disease. Kung ma-clear o kaya matanggal lahat ng baboy, sana sa susunod na mga panahon, mabigyan din ng uh, panibagong uh, aalagain naman ang mga katulad namin. Authorities have placed quarantine checkpoints in several areas in Cavite. Calling operations within one kilometer radius from ground zero are underway. The government has committed to pay hog raisers for every animal called due to the disease. But Romero Patok, a hog raiser, complains he will be compensated for only 17 of his 32 hogs. Kung may bigay mo ang gobyerno, di, sana itong pati kasama biik na hindi pa nagwawalay, meron din silang may tulong man lang sa may-ari ng babuyan. Affected hog racers call on the government to help them find alternative livelihood. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Shining scientists recently announced that they have detailed the structure of the African swine fever or ASF virus. Scientists said their discovery will offer insight into how the virus attacks host cells while avoiding the infected pig's immune system, according to China Daily. Scientists added that knowing the structure of the virus is expected to help develop an effective vaccine for ASF, which has been wiping out the country's pig population at an alarming rate. Climate change hampers progress on fighting epidemics, according to the Global Health Fund. Miguel Rey de Leon reports. Climate change is making it harder to eradicate deadly epidemics, with rising temperatures helping mosquitoes spread malaria in higher places in Africa, according to a Global Health Fund organization. And what we are seeing is that uh, mosqui mosquitoes that carry malaria are um, becoming present in some of the places where they weren't present before um, because the, the, cold, the coldest points have become less cold um, in these high altitude areas and obviously that's a very worrying development. Other potential deadly consequences of climate change include more intense cyclones which leave an increased risk of infections in their wake said Peter Sands, the executive director of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. The Global Fund is pursuing a United Nations target of ending the three epidemics by 2030. The fund had sent emergency resources after flooding caused by Cyclone Idai resulted in thousands of new malaria cases in Mozambique this year. In October, the Global Fund secured record funding pledges of just over $14 billion for three years. Sand said the world's ability to hit the sustainable development goals adopted by the UN on the three diseases would partly depend on whether countries implement increases in healthcare spending of $46 billion over the same period. African countries in particular are being urged to increase spending to 15% of their budgets on healthcare. Of the three epidemics, progress on TB has been the slowest. Malaria infected 219 million people worldwide in 2017, killing 435,000 according to the World Health Organization. Most of the victims were babies or young children in sub-Saharan Africa. In 2017, TB killed 1.6 million people, including 300,000 people with HIV, the World Health Organization said, making it one of the top 10 causes of death worldwide. Miguel Rey de Leon, UNTV News and Rescue, USA.
And to complete the most significant news for this day, why news continues, here are the top stories. Incumbent and former senators and other prominent personalities pay tribute to the late former Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. at a necrological service this morning. Asher Kadapan Jr. has more of the details. Last night, upon arriving from his Japan trip, President Rodrigo Duterte went to Heritage Park in Taguig City to pay tribute to the late former Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. At around 10 this morning, Pimentel's remains were brought from Heritage Park to the Senate building in Pasay City. It stayed at the plenary hall for a necrological service. The bereaved family of Pimentel were condoled by former and current senators who delivered their eulogies. One of them was Senate President Vicente Tito Soto III, who enumerated some of Pimentel's achievements and thanked him for his contributions. Pwede naman palang pumasok sa politika at mamaalam na marangal pa rin. Paalam po. Senator Aquilino Coco Pimentel III couldn't help but get emotional as he delivered his message. Saying goodbye permanently to someone as special as Tatay, someone you admire and love. It's actually a sad event. Nanny Pimentel served as a Philippine senator from 1987 to 1992 and was re-elected to the post from 1998 to 2010. He sat as the Senate President, Majority Leader, and Minority Leader for several years. He was one of the personalities who championed federalism in the country, which is among President Duterte's agenda. From Pasay City, Pimentel's remains were brought at around 1 p.m. to Cagayan de Oro, where he served as mayor in 1980. After three days in CDO, Pimentel's body will be returned to Heritage Park on Friday. The burial is scheduled for Saturday, October 26. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Meanwhile, Zaldi Ampatuan, one of the primary accused in the Maguindanao massacre, is in the hospital due to a heart ailment. Bureau of Jail Management and Penology or BJMP spokesperson Javier Solda said Ampatuan was rushed to the hospital Monday afternoon. He said the high-profile suspect suffered from cardiovascular disease, infarction secondary to cardiac dysrhythmia. He stressed that no special treatment was given to Ampatuan. In other news, a lawmaker suggests the suspension of the recruitment of new cadets of the Philippine Military Academy. According to House Committee on Justice Vice Chairman and Akobiko Party List Representative Alfredo Garbin Jr., the additional 27 new cases of maltreatment in the Philippine Military Academy, or PMA, shows that there are systemic, grave, and moral flaws in the academy. Garbin suggests to suspend recruitment in the academy until until it can ensure the safety and well-being of its cadets. The lawmaker also suggests the Judge Advocate General of the Armed Forces of the Philippines should lead the cleansing in the PMA and remove the notion that hazing is needed to mold good officials and defenders of the country. And for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. Stephanie, good evening. Good evening, William. As the clock ticks down to the deadline for Britain's departure on October 31, Brexit is hanging in the balance as divided lawmakers debate when, how, and even whether it should happen more than three years since the 2016 referendum. Joe McBurmas tells us why. In another day of Brexit drama in the 800-year-old Westminster seat of power, lawmakers handed UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson the first major parliamentary victory of his premiership by signaling their support for his deal in an early legislative hurdle. Eyes to the right, 308. The nose to the left, 322. 
But that was overshadowed just minutes later when lawmakers defeated him on his timetable to rush the legislation through the House of Commons in just three days, prompting the government to say it would pause the legislative process. And we now face further uncertainty and the EU must now make up their minds over how to answer Parliament's request for a delay. EU Council President Donald Tusk recommended late on Tuesday evening that the leaders of the remaining 27 member states back a delay. It is now for the rest of the bloc to decide whether the October 31st deadline should be pushed back to the end of January as requested by Johnson in a letter he was forced to send on Saturday by British lawmakers. France is ready to grant an additional few days in order to facilitate Parliament's vote but rules out any extension beyond that, a diplomatic source said. Johnson had hoped to make the delay request unnecessary by passing the Brexit law fast enough to leave on time. On Tuesday, lawmakers did vote by 329 to 299 in favor of the second reading of the legislation for the Brexit deal. Still no guarantee of success since the bill could be amended by lawmakers who want changes. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, London, United Kingdom. U.S. President Jimmy Carter has been hospitalized with a minor pelvic fracture after fall on Monday night, the second such accident this month for the nation's oldest living president. Carter fell at his home in Plains, Georgia, the center said in a post on Twitter, but added he is in good spirits and is looking forward to recovering at home. For now, he is being observed and treated at the Phoebe Sumter Medical Center in nearby America's Georgia for observation and treatment. An armed man stole an ambulance in Oslo, injuring three people, including two babies, when he drove off and hit a family. Meanwhile, Hong Kong has released the murder suspect, whose case led to plans to change extradition rules, which then triggered the city's mass protests. This report details why. In Hong Kong, Hong Kong man Chan Tong Kai, who murdered his ex-girlfriend in Taiwan and case had sparked the months-long anti-extradition bill protests, was released from prison on Wednesday. Chan told the media that he apologizes to his ex-girlfriend's family for the tragedy and for creating an irreversible damage and pain. Chen, a Hong Kong citizen, was accused of murdering his girlfriend in Taiwan last year before fleeing back to the financial hub. Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam held up Chan's case as an example of why an extradition bill that would have allowed suspects to be sent from Hong Kong to Greater China, including the mainland Taiwan and Macau, was needed. Hong Kong has been reeling from five months of unrest originally triggered by the extradition bill, but which has now evolved into a pro-democracy movement. The government has announced it will withdraw the bill, but the protests have not stopped. In Europe, a man has been charged with attempted murder after a stolen ambulance crashed into a family in the Norwegian capital Oslo, injuring three people including twin babies. The alleged hijacker sustained gunshot wounds after police returned fire. A woman has been charged with illegal possession of a firearm. A motive for the attack has yet to be established, although police are investigating possible links with the far-right extremists. Meanwhile, an old lighthouse on the Danish west coast has risked falling into the sea because of coastline erosion was moved inland on Tuesday. Hundreds of people braved cold and wind to see the 120-year-old Rubberg nude lighthouse slowly being moved to a more secure location. The 25-meter tall lighthouse had been put on wheels and rails for the around 60-meter trip inland. The lighthouse is a popular tourist destination and is visited by around 250,000 people every year. Stephanie C, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you very much. Stephanie C reporting live from Hong Kong. Cancer is the second leading cause of death globally, 
claiming an estimated 9.6 million lives worldwide in 2018. But scientists have found a new method to treat the disease called immunotherapy, which they say has significantly improved the survival rate of, for some cancer patients. Annie Mancilia will tell us why. Two scientists, Tasuko Honjo of Japan and James P. Allison of the U.S., shared the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation. Cancer immunotherapy is a topic attracting a lot of attention at the ongoing 17th International Congress of Immunology in Beijing. The event is held from October 19 to 23. During an interview on the sidelines of the conference, Japanese immunologist Tasuko Honjo said, Immunotherapy has revolutionized cancer treatment in that previous cancer treatments, including chemotherapy, could not prolong the overall survival in most cases. So chemotherapy basically targets some uh, cellular mechanism, which is also shared by the normal cell and you cannot increase the dose to the level that kills our own body. But the immunotherapy do not affect our own cells. They recognize difference between normal cell and cancer cells. And therefore, uh, it's very specific to cancer cell and do not damage our own body. He added that immunotherapy could maintain the quality of life, especially for the elderly, by stopping the growth of tumors in the near future. We hope by combination or improvement of the immunotherapy, we may be able to stop the growth of tumor. Even we cannot eliminate whole tumors. Then it's a kind of peaceful coexistence and that could be uh, possible at least within this century. He said melanoma, lung cancer, kidney cancer and lymphoma are likely among the first cancers to be cured. Annie Mancilia, UNTV News and Rescue. Organizers of the 30th Southeast Asian or Sea Games in the province of La Union are ramping up their preparations with barely just over a month left before the country's hosting of the prestigious sporting event. Toto Fabros has the details. The Department of Public Works and Highways are now rushing the road repairs and the improvement of the drainage canal in Barangay Orbistondo, San Juan, La Union to reach its deadline on November 15. The street lights and the national highway are also being retrofitted. The town of San Juan will be one of the venues for the surfing competition of the Southeast Asian Games this year. According to Cristina Antonio, a Sea Games organizer, 46 international athletes will compete in the surfing competition that will run from December 1 to 10. So basically, nandito na by mid-November is the media team and also um, some of the athletes for uh, practice. 500 policemen will be deployed in the surfing competition to ensure the security of the participant and the spectators. Siguro dun sabihin nyo, kailangan natin magdaga, talagang i-full blast yung mga tao natin, i-maximize natin doon para hindi tayo masingitan, mahirap na. Uh, Malit lang yung uh, area, so kailangan na uh, nakatutok tayo doon. The local government of San Juan de Union reminds motorists they will implement a rerouting scheme starting December 1. Only small vehicles will be allowed to enter the national highway while trucks and buses must take the diversion road. Toto Pablos UNTV News and Rescue, San Juan La Union. The world's most expensive chocolate was launched in Mumbai. Nina Armilio has this story. Priced at 400,000 rupees or $6,221 per kilogram, the limited edition trio of truffle chocolates has made its way into the Guinness Book of World Records as the most expensive chocolate. Trinity Truffles Extraordinaire was created by luxury chocolate brand Fabel Exquisite Chocolates. 
Philippe Cantacini, the French Michelin star chef behind the concept, said the chocolates represent the cycle of life in three stages, the creator, the nurturer, and the destroyer. When I began to work on the Trinity, I didn't really know that this product could become, uh, could be in the Guinness book, you see. Um, but step by step, we chose very, very wonderful product. You see, it's a very expensive product. And um, Farrell's or me, we wanted to put the best of sensation, the best flavor. Ingredients collected from around the world, such as Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee, Tahitian vanilla beans, Belgian white chocolate, and Piedmont hazelnuts helped to give the chocolates such a high price tag. In 2012, Danish artisan chocolate maker Frins Nipschild created the world's most expensive individual chocolate, La Madeleine au Truff, which cost $250 apiece. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this October 23, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. I'll say this for once, no? Lifestyle check, open mo pa yung salin mo, etc. Now, remember, there's a vetting process of which is being undertaken by the office of the president. So whatever the suggestions of the public on how the president should choose the next GPNP, I suggest we respect the president. Ito po ay kasama na rin sa pagmamalis natin ng supply pero sa tingin po natin by November ay hindi na rin po ganun kalaki ang pangailangan ng tubig sa irigasyon po. Nandun na sila sa punto na bago mag-ani, no? Ang ECC ng stock kaliwadap is illegal. Uh, it contradicts uh, and violates the law uh, on environmental impact assessment. Saying goodbye permanently to someone as special as Tatay, someone you admire and love, It's actually a sad event.